Hello, everybody. Welcome back. If you've just had a lunch break, and welcome back to anybody who is joining us, uh, if it's a different time of day where you are joining us from as well. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to Innovation 2020. For some of you, it might be your first session of the two-day event. So just to set a little bit of context, all of the sessions um, from the last two days and the rest of today, they are all about bringing civil servants and civil service partners together um, to talk about innovation that's happening, to look at some of the barriers uh, that might be in place to innovation and some of the enablers as well, hopefully to come up with some of those solutions that will help us get better at working across departments, across professions and across countries in terms of sharing good practice. I'm Siobhan Benita, I was a UK civil servant, I'm now a government commentator and a facilitator for these events. Um, and today, the panel we are going to be discussing right now is one of the five themes that have been going on through the um, Innovation 2020 event. And this one, um, the theme is commissioning and deploying new technologies. So new and emerging digital technologies in particular have huge potential to support innovative practices and innovation services. But developing, commissioning, and deploying them demands a specific set of skills, along with reformed planning, funding, procurement, and management systems. And emerging technologies like AI bring new challenges around bias, around ethics, and accountability. And on the horizon loom new generations of tech, such as quantum computing. This session will look at how civil services can adapt their approach to suit the strengths, the demands, and the risks of digital technologies, and to consider how some of those technologies are likely to evolve, evolve over the coming years. In a moment, I'm going to be introducing our fantastic panel. We've got five really expert panel members here. But I'd also like to say, if you are watching now, you have the potential to send in some of your own questions. So please don't be shy. We've got great panel members, as I said. Now is your opportunity to put questions to them. And at the end, time permitting, we will get through as many of those questions as possible. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our fantastic panel members, starting with Chris Ferguson. There they are there, you can see everybody on the screen. Chris Ferguson is Director of Service Design and Assurance, the Government Digital Service in the United Kingdom. And Chris was actually chair of a workshop yesterday looking at the next generation of digital technologies, which was for um, kind of cross sections. So officials from all kinds of different backgrounds, professions and departments. We then have Mark Palmer who's head of public sector for Europe, Middle East and Africa with Google Cloud, who are one of the great knowledge partners of Innovation 2020. So Chris didn't chair a workshop yesterday, so we'll be picking his brains for his own kind of wealth of experience and expertise on these issues. Then we have Stefan Schlosser, who's policy advisor, digital state division from the Federal Chancellery in Germany. And Stefan chaired a workshop yesterday for digital data technology, knowledge management and statistics professionals. So officials who work in that kind of area. So it'll be really interesting to get their specific feedback and thoughts on some of these um, areas. And then we have Melinda Johnson, who's commercial director, Department of Health and Social Care in the United Kingdom. And Melinda was also chair of a workshop yesterday, um, which mainly had commercial and procurement professionals. So they'll bring a different perspective as well to some of these issues. And last but not least, we have Hans Jörg Schaper, who's Deputy Director General, Information Technology Directorate General, Federal Ministry of Finance in Germany. And Hans, Hans Jörg also chaired a workshop yesterday, and that was for finance, tax, fraud, error and debt professionals. So again, we have three different groups of professionals who were all discussing some of these issues yesterday. So I'm going to start by putting a question, a different question to each of our panel members. I'll come one by one in turn, and then we'll have two or three other questions after that where hopefully we can get into more discussion, and then hopefully we'll have some questions from the audience. So I'm going to turn to Chris first. Um, Chris, you, as I say, you chaired the kind of um, interdisciplinary workshop yesterday, so you have people with lots of different viewpoints. Um, what kind of their thoughts on what new technologies have the greatest potential to support innovation in government? 
Thanks, Yvonne, and hello, everyone. Uh, so, yes, I chaired a, a kind of a multidisciplinary panel um, on uh, the use of innovation in government. And uh, for that session, we broke it actually down into three distinct areas to discuss. The first was technology, the second was culture, and the third was around business processes uh, and governance. Uh, and we, we asked a question right at the start of the session saying, which of these three areas um, do, do, the, do the people participating feel that that government uh, would most benefit from uh, innovating in. Uh, and we did the same part of the session. The session. Um, and so the first poll was actually had culture, uh, innovation in culture being of most value. Uh, and that was 55% of the, the people in the session. And at the end of the session, that had actually gone up to 75%, oh. with technology only being 10% at the beginning and then 5% at the end. Um, so we ended up having, um, you know, according to the needs of, of the of the session, a discussion about culture. And it's very interesting because we quickly got into what exactly is it about government culture, and there are people there from governments across the world that maybe stifles innovation. Uh, and we got into risk versus reward, um, and how, you know, whether you're, if you're a venture capitalist, you know, you're taking risks, um, you're making a series of bets, and maybe you have a you know, a 20% success rate, a 50% success rate. But in government, we're, we're kind of obliged by our, our governance and by using taxpayers' money to promise a 100% success rate because innovation requires experimentation and inevitably failure. Um, but because our processes don't really take that into account, um, you're in a kind of, you must not deliberately fail at anything because that would be wasting public funds um, to kind of go into something not knowing if it's going to be successful or not. So you have an immediate barrier, a culture barrier um, that, that comes into play. Uh, and the other cultural element that needs overcome, uh, as we discussed in the group, was around how over time culture can become an informal set of rules. So even if you do want to buy things differently, if you do want to deliver things differently, um, you may come across in other professions, people who are unwilling to go with a new way of doing things. And not because it's uh, against any specific rules, but just because the prevailing culture um, over potentially decades uh, means that that kind of approach is, is different. You're not following in footsteps of other officials uh, and you're trying to chart a new course uh, and there's an inertia uh, in the system that comes with that. So we had a really interesting conversation about culture. We did talk about technology um, a little bit, but we talked mainly about technology in a gen general way to describe it as a design choice, um, that the needs of the user, the needs of the service you're developing, the needs of the business really define the technology you choose. And if that happens to be a cutting edge, highly innovative technology, um, you know, use of algorithms, artificial intelligence, et cetera, then that's appropriate. But if existing technology exists, uh, you know, uh, that is perfectly suited to meet the, the needs of the service and of the end user, then it's completely appropriate to, to use that too. Great. Thank you so much. Graham. Interesting that um, you, you, you wanted to have a conversation about technology and straight away people started talking about culture. So maybe that's something we can come back to, I think, when we talk about maybe some of the barriers and the obstacles as well that are in place to adopting some of these technologies to drive forward innovation. Mark, I'm going to come to you now for your thoughts on kind of what are the biggest opportunities here if we can get civil servants to um, adopt new technologies. I mean, many already are, but we want more to do this. Yes, thank you, Siobhan. And I would actually agree, um, culture is the biggest inhibitor um, or enabler of new technologies. So. Um, actually, it's in line with our thinking. It's typically 75, 85% of the challenge. Um, in terms of the improvements of new technologies, um, everyone, I mean, new technologies effectively help communication and collaboration, both not just internal, but external. If we look at how we're all using new technology in our personal lives, that's essentially what this technology provides. <clears throat> um, but importantly, it also enables agility uh, and agility to change. Coming back to culture again, and mm -hmm. new technologies really enable that rapid change, as we've seen no more than any other time, in, certainly in my career over the past uh, eight or nine months. 
And so embracing these new technologies, um, which bring with them a certain sense of agility as opposed to the legacy technologies that my industry created over the past 30 years, and it's been designed for change. So whether that is cloud, whether that is some of the underlying technologies that we use in things like cloud, like you may have heard of things like containerization, all of these technologies are enabling change, rapid change. So um, teams can change architectures, can change the design of what is being of the business to deliver. So it's agility is the first thing. Um, and it also refocuses the organization from managing complex IT infrastructures to really focusing on the business outcomes. And that is really a key element of this change of culture. So rather than having large teams you know, managing complex stacks of infrastructure, you're effectively giving that to companies to manage for you through a cloud uh, platform of some sort or another, or using that even in-house, it simplifies the technology and asking those teams to focus more on the business outcomes and the data to enable those improvements in services by the citizens or business. And so really the big opportunity here, Siobhan, is around how do you improve services to citizens or, or businesses or whoever the, the stakeholders are. For example, in, in welfare, we've seen huge changes in welfare uh, policy over the past few months. How do you correctly and timely fashion deliver those um, welfare payments? How do you check for uh, improper payments? How do you triage healthcare quicker, uh, manage outpatient bookings faster? deliver telemedicine, all of these are very topical. How do you roll out vaccines? <laughs> I mean, all of these, you know, there's there's another challenge that seems to come at us almost on a weekly basis. And so having um, adaptable technology that can really be agile to address and, and assist um, governments in the latest challenge that it's faced with. And this is really about using that technology to plan and triage resources, ultimately. Technology will never take the place of the human being, but it is there to support the human being in the decision-making process. So I think Siobhan, that's probably given enough ideas and thoughts yeah. for me. Um, as you can tell, I could talk all afternoon uh, about it. <laughs> Let me hand back over to you. Well, there'll be more opportunity in a minute, don't worry. So it's really nice to hear there. Just a reminder, obviously, that what it's about is improving the civil services. It's about improving the public services, improving services to the public, um, ultimately. And also something that's come up in other panels, which you touched on there, is the, um, the current pandemic and COVID and how that's kind of forced um, civil services and governments to act in different ways. And maybe we can touch on that in terms of overcoming some of the obstacles when we get into a discussion as well. Stefan, I'm going to ask you now to feed back in terms of your workshop yesterday. What did your kind of officials want to see in terms of innovation in the use of technologies and what might the barriers have been for that to happen that they saw at the moment? Stefan, over to you. It's very interesting to see that uh, the people that um, took part in my workshop totally agree with what uh, Mark and Chris said. So they are. They have also the opinion that um, that culture is uh, much more important than technology or organization, for example, processes. Um, and we discussed about the barriers and drivers of innovation, and also about uh, the strengths, demands, and risks um, of innovation. And um, we found out that there are some um, some points um, that also. Um, uh, go together with culture. So, for example, um, the people think that we need the freedom to explore ideas. Uh, much more we have today um, that we need a culture of failure. So it must be allowed mm -hmm. also to do to do things wrong, to fail. Um, and um, uh, they also say that our packed agendas are a problem in terms of innovation. Um, this is uh, what uh, what I also found very interesting. Um, and one of uh, one of um, the members of my workshop asked if the public sector should be an early adopter. So do we do we really need um, innovation? Um, and we all agreed that um, we we don't we, we we don't maybe we don't have to be an early adopter, but um, it's very important that public sector is also up to date. So we definitely need um, innovation. Um, and to to become more innovative, it um, might be also um, very important to 
to um, to improve the recruitment processes, so to find um, to find um, people that are very innovative. Let's say, mm -hmm. I think these are the main conclusions of the workshop. <clears throat> Fantastic. Thank you, Stefan. Interesting. We had a panel this morning on skills and tools and the issue of recruitment and retention um, of people was uh, obviously a big part of that. So we're starting to see these themes emerging um, from the different workshops. Melinda, I'm going to ask you the same. So you chaired the workshop with commercial and procurement professionals. So it'd be interesting. What did they think about in terms of adopting new technologies and, and um, facilitating innovation? Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. And it's funny, you know, because we too uh, talked a lot about culture and the way we do things around here and not much specifically on technology. So it's quite an interesting theme that's emerging, isn't it? So um, my people were tended to be procurement and commercial. So we were looking at this very much through the lens of that and um, really thinking about how we could drive uh, more innovation in the way in which we do our commercial work. So whether that's uh, the approaches that we use or the um, procedures or, you know, the legislative framework that we work within, how we can really drive innovation. And we did touch on a lot of barriers, which no doubt will come out in the discussion later. But some of the things we were uh, talking about included that when you think about politicians, ministers and what have you, uh, they are primarily interested in the outcome. And the word outcome has been uh, brought up a few times in the last 10 minutes or so. And outcome is a really uh, key way of thinking about what it is you're trying to deliver. Unfortunately, sometimes we get bogged down in thinking about um, a product or a solution far too soon. And that obviously will stifle innovation. So we must think about outcomes being king if you like, rather than necessarily how we go about driving the output. And uh, we talked a lot about the importance of uh, collaboration uh, with different functions working together, whether that's a procurement commercial function, with the finance function, the HR function, but in particular, the strategy function came, um, came up. And we were all saying that, um, you know, people that work in strategy in government departments are sometimes um, um, well, they need to, uh, their profile needs to be raised a little bit more and we need to ensure that they are absolutely involved in all big commercial projects, whatever they would be, the tech or otherwise, in order to ensure that the outcome that the politician, the minister, the government is trying to achieve is in fact strategically well thought through. Now, when you're thinking about innovation, we discuss how sometimes this can be a bit of an overwhelming <laughs> Uh, prospective. So one of the ways which we thought was a good way to, is to chunk things down, to break things up into, well, segment it really, segment the outcome into manageable chunks and choose uh, some of those uh, chunks, some of those segments to really think um, innovatively about. And um, we can use technology um, approaches using the technology areas such as, you know, the agile approaches, the sprint and sprints and so on like that. Um, but moreover, it's about just trying to get that cross functional, collaborative, uh, one team working to think in the most innovative and creative ways about how we could go about delivering the outcome. So much of this is iterative, um, you know, you, we've talked about failure, you might fail a couple of times, but you've got to keep going, learning from that failure and, um, and, and pursuing the goal. And another aspect of it, again, it comes back to culture, is, um, is the risk appetite of the department. And one of the benefits of um, doing things in smaller chunks is you don't fall so far, do you, if you have to get it wrong. Um, and particularly if you put things up so you can have different approaches to innovation for each task you're dealing with. So some might work, some might not. You're not putting all your eggs in one basket. So there's something about managing risk um, effectively and establishing your risk appetite at the outset so people feel empowered to, um, to pursue what they, what they think should be done. And um, I'll end in a minute because there's plenty more we can talk about later, but 
communication and engagement was another theme as well. Um, and that is communicating the policy leaders, whether they're director generals, they were mentioned earlier, weren't they? And, uh, and ministers about what it is you're doing for them, taking them on the journey, not necessarily to the nth degree of detail, but keeping them informed uh, as to how things are going, because that gives people comfort uh, in uh, how you're going about it. Thanks, Melinda. So really, really good insights there in terms of better communication of outcomes so that everybody understands what, what what's being aimed for, um, a different approach to risk management. Again, that's come up in lots of panels um, already today. Um, I like the idea of chunking things down as well. Um, again, as, some, as we've already had today in this session, um, being able to uh, not be so afraid of failure and learning from failure is a good thing. And then that really stubborn thing, which I want to come back to in the middle of, in a minute about cross-functional working, because it's something that we all know we need, but we just can't seem to crack it. So last but not least, I'm going to come to Hans, Hans Jörg, to tell me a bit about what was said in his workshop about how the officials working in that area, which was finance, tax fraud broadly, all of those areas, what did they think about opportunities to innovate through the use of new technologies? Hello to everyone. Um, thank you for being part of Innovation 2020. Yes, in my workshop, we discussed uh, from the point of view of the finance and tax professionals. And we discussed um, how we see the opportunities to innovate in the use of technology. And secondly, we focused on the question, what factors are constraining progress? Um, we find out that uh, in the digital world, the role of the civil service will change. We have to enable participation. So we underline that we have, have in the future a so-called front office, which enables a permanent and direct contact to the citizens and we will establish a back office to process on applications completely digital. And uh, when Stefan mentioned the word, should we be the innovators in the civil service, I um, would underline that we, that we will use new technologies like web-based portals, online services, AI systems and blockchain, chatbots and big data analy analytics um, to be up to date in the civil service. So I think we have to adopt this new role uh, and even to be innovator in the digital process, which um, is the main changer, the main game changer. Um, on the second hand, we see there are some things that um, constrain this progress. Um, members of my workshop mentioned that there is a lack of funding uh, and being part or member of the Ministry of Finance, I see what they mean because we have to look on the, the, um, the revenues and the expenditure, even in this um, quite difficult economic situation right now. Uh, second, they mentioned they are limited hardware. Um, not everybody is able to work from home because not everybody has a tablet, for example. And they mentioned that some platforms are not working. Um, so we have to focus even on that, that we have to avoid the mistakes um, sometimes happening, um, even processing digital uh, working progress. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, thanks very much, Anna. That was really good. I mean, you, you've kind of nicely transitioned us, I think, into the discussion around constraints and obstacles and barriers. But before we go there, I just wanted to pick up. So 
Stefan, if I'm correct in saying you were saying that your group said that the public sector doesn't necessarily need to be the early adopter in kind of new technologies and innovation. Whereas I think what Hans Jörg was saying there is that we should be the early adopters in some of these things. So I just very quickly wanted to take the thoughts of the other three panelists on what they think on that. Should, should the civil service, should civil services around the world and their partners be leading the way, be showing the way in this? Or is this something that we should be learning from others? Sure. Could I, could I uh, add um, one aspect sure. to this uh, item? Yeah. Um, we, we just established a lab called uh, Artificial Intelligence and Quantum Computing. Even to um, concept or uh, draft the concept of artificial intelligence in civil services. And that is in my opinion, the new role of the civil service, even in Germany. Yeah, okay, thank you. So Melinda, I'm gonna ask you, if you like, just quickly to talk about this, should we be the early adopters or not? Should we be pushing, pushing the boundaries oh, on this? Not. In all seriousness, I think it depends on what it is, doesn't it? And, um, and you know, we do have fiscal constraints. In fact, one of the things my team were talking about was, um, uh, Certainly in the UK, we tend to have sort of yearly cycles of funding and some of this thing is a bit, um, you have to prioritise basically and prioritise heavily uh, where you're going to uh, use taxpayers' money. Obviously, we have to prioritise and evidence things and do business cases and governance and all that. We can't just be, you know, profligate in any way. We have to think about the exactly where we're spending our money. So we have to balance that. And the funding cycles can constrain us because sometimes the more innovative things we want to do are sort of put to the bottom of the list whilst we focus on uh, the main things that we know we've got to do. Uh, so there is something that our team talked about in my way of prioritisation. But I think what we can do is, is, is feel the match on innovative thinking and we shouldn't constrain ourselves in our thinking, you know, the way in which we go about our business, albeit cognizant of the fact that, you know, we can't be uh, uh, wasting money. We have to have a good, uh, you know, uh, we've got to feel fairly confident that there's going to be some degree of success and some benefit from what we're doing. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, it, it could be problematic. Yeah, I think that question of prioritising when there are so many challenges and so many huge demands at the moment is a really, really difficult one for civil servants. Mark, I'm going to come to you to, one, give your thoughts on um, constraints and kind of obstacles that you see, but also you've, you've had a good um, kind of oversight of what's going on in civil services. Do you think they are kind of leading the way? Should they be leading the way in innovation and technologies? Um, to some extent, I agree with Siobhan. It's, um, it depends. Um, the scale and the challenges faced by many parts of public sector are so huge and so unique that really it, it, it really demands innovation to be able to manage those situations. Other parts of the public sector, yeah, you probably would not want to innovate. And so it really depends. But I certainly think innovation um, in terms of the, the, the ability to address the big challenges that are coming uh, to all of us at the moment is the way forwards. And I think there are four things that really public sector organisations really struggle with when it comes to new technology. And in short, they're trust, skills, uh, the commercial model, but also there is a technical challenge. And in, in two minutes, I'll tell you what these are. Trust is about, do we really trust these AI machine learning models? And where is my data and what's happening to it? They're the two big things in uh, under the subject of trust. Um, at Google, we use something called explainable AI, so you can explain all of these AI machine learning models to customers and they can and the users can see how they're working. So that is really important of trust. As human beings, we like to understand how things work rather than a black box model. When it comes to data, uh, we encrypt every single bit of data, no matter where it is in the process, and the customers have complete control over their data. So trust is really important. and. For technology companies like mine, we have to take this very, very seriously. Otherwise, these new technologies are just not utilized if customers are not trusting the technology. Skills, um, and I don't just mean technical skills, I mean business skills in how the, the ability of what technology and innovation can deliver for the business and how it can have a positive impact on the outcome. So it's skills as much outside of the technology shop, actually, that's important. 
Commercial, I'll touch on briefly because, for example, cloud changes budgeting models from um, capital models to revenue type models. And then there's the question of how do we know how much you're going to spend on a cloud because you pay for what you consume. We have mechanisms, mechanisms for capping that, but it does require a change in how you manage the commercial relationship with suppliers as the public sector. And then the one technical point that is a challenge is the legacy. There is so much technical legacy around, uh, and by that I mean old systems, be they mainframes, be they software stacks, and, uh, and there's such huge amounts of data, you've got to take great care in how you move from the legacy world into the modern world. Yeah. And so really they're the main challenges um, as, as, as we see them. Brilliant, thanks, Mark. That's a really good overview, especially the yeah the legacy challenges are huge, definitely. Chris, I want to come back to you for the last voice on on the issue of constraints and also your thoughts on the extent to which public sector is a kind of leader. Sure. Um, so on constraints, yeah, we've we've said it a few times already. Um, there's culture, and I think it's important for people to recognise that uh, you know as a digital leader in the British government, I'm not in charge of all the things. Uh, that make up my context. So I might be responsible for digital data and technology, but I'm not responsible for the HR profession, the estates profession. I'm not responsible for the commercial profession, you know, uh, you know, or for public procurement. So all the all the things, all the links in the chain that you have to influence, uh, in just in order to get yourself to a foundation where you can begin to perform and develop, you know, entirely digital systems, entirely digital processes, even just to land agile methodology as an approach to tackling government problems, um, it's important to recognise that your digital colleagues aren't necessarily uh, gifted, you know, the full scope, the full jurisdiction it takes to make a lot of these things happen. So constraints, I think that's really important to understand that it's a massive team effort um, and you need to define yourself uh, and how you engage with all these already usually quite well-defined parts of government. With regard to innovation and early adoption, thing, I think the way I turn, I recognise everything Mark said uh, as, as correct. Um, I would say a lot of it boils down to whether or not government can be a smart customer of a, a given technology. Uh, often what we need in government uh, when we're trying to move away from legacy systems is we need flexibility. We often need something that's quite a commodity stage so that it's, it is trusted, it is um, resilient, uh, bulletproof, uh, can be adopted, is known and understood, it can work with other systems. Um, and we need things to work at scale. Uh, because we are a government, but but even that needs to be understood in the context. I mean, a, a given high street bank probably does more transactions in a week than the government does in a year. So it, it's we're not so unique and special in, in, the, in the context yeah. of scale. Um, but where we can be a leader around new technology is around um, how we incorporate it ethically uh, into the provision of public services, um, how we look at regulation uh, of new technology, both in terms of how we apply it, but how in the industry you know these are areas these are ground areas we need to be groundbreaking in um, because the pace of change is so significant and we need to not stifle innovation and stifle industry um, but we need to do our best to understand and keep up with the impacts on wider society and on service provision and then my final point would be something i'm very interested in personally which is uh, looking at all the innovation all the technology out there is what constitutes the the 21st century equivalent of public goods um, you know, in, in the in the past, we've had police forces and streetlights, things like that, that are paid for out of general taxation, uh, but are 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 there for everybody. Uh, and I, I find it hard to believe, given the digital revolution, the technology revolution, that governments around the world shouldn't be thinking about what are the public goods, what are the things that everyone should have and have access to and be able to use. Um, you know, that that is provided uh, by government. Uh, and I think that's a fascinating question uh, to think about as we we move into the kind of the next phase of you know, digital data and technology in government. Brilliant. Thank you. I, I can't believe how quickly the time has gone. I think we've probably got uh, time for one more round of um, thoughts from all of you. And we've had a couple of comments. So one comment is agreeing with what people have said about it's difficult to be leading the way when in the civil service you have those legacy issues, for example, using repurposed IT systems. So it's quite hard to be kind of leading the way on some of this. But I want to put a question to you from somebody who sent a question in. This comes in from Rachel um, and add that with uh, one thing that I would like to pick up on as well. So the question is, how do we innovate while keeping the lights on? So in some instances, we can't afford to fail. Mm. 
Yeah, we have to we have to keep collecting tax and paying benefits. So how do we do all these new things safely? So I'm going to put that question to all of you. And at the same time, maybe because this is the final round, give me some thoughts on great examples of where you think we're managing to do this. If you can think of one thing where we're managing to innovate well, maybe something you've seen because of the pandemic where we've been forced to kind of innovate or use new technologies. And I'm going to come to Hans. Yeah, first. Oh, first, okay. uh, thanks. And, uh, that is a very good question, and I, I, I'd like to ask uh, very, very shortly. First, um, we are inventing new project management systems, so the skills of the the, 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 the new uh, members of the Ministry of Finance will uh, be that the stuff will be more interdisciplinary. We need more data scientists. We need a culture of feedback and flexibility and the organization, uh, organization as well will be flat in future. And um, at least to keep, it, uh, to keep it secure, we have to keep the data safe and secure. So we have to invent in cloud uh, technology, but in cloud technology that uh, enables us the uh, digital governance and the digital sovereignty um, on the level of the federation or even in Germany, the countries, the lender. Uh, at least um, I'd like to mention, and uh, we need a change of, uh, of mentality. I think we have to cooperate in the future with startups to enable us to see what will be the next step in digitalization. Shogun? Brilliant. Thanks so much. That's really, really useful there. And to, uh, I'm going to come to Melinda next for your thoughts, Melinda. Um, thank you. Um, I think you can do, the, do both. I think you can keep the lights on, keep doing what you've been doing, and then pilot something new at the same time. So it's not like a binary thing. You can you can pilot something new, uh, think creatively and innovatively from a technology point of view or whatever. And then if it works, scale that up and replace the existing thing. Um, and, you know, I'm talking about that theoretically at the moment. I'm not a technical uh, technology specialist, but certainly on policy areas, that's the sort of thing that we've been we've been trying to do. That we're thinking about things like the social care system, for example to the Department of Health and Social and we've been um, you know uh, thinking about new what creative ways of, of um, tackling some of the challenges there so I think um, you know as long as you can um, start small test things be prepared to fail and then scale up when they work you can keep them on the bigger thing I just want to add as well um, my team that we were talking to yesterday um, talked a lot about systems thinking and I don't mean system as in a technology system. I mean, in terms of a system such as the whole of the government in the UK, for example, tackling a particular strategic issue together, um, cross-departmentally and from a policy point of view. And we could do that, you know, through the lens of technology as well. So we just wanted to add in the importance of proper systems thinking and not being inward focused uh, on your own departmental yeah. priorities. Yeah, absolutely. So not just culture, it does involve kind of systems and processes as well. Great. I'm going to come to Mark. Mark, for your thoughts on this. Thank you. I, I would agree with that, um, Melinda. So you can certainly trial things in parallel to live production. You can create a sandbox. You can stream off data. You could even stream off live data into your sandbox to try it innovative ideas, um, whatever they may be separately. So as you rightly say, um, you can't, you know, you've got to keep the lights going or you've got to modify the plane as you're still flying. It's another analogy. Um, but, but it is possible with modern technology to be able to create a sandbox for fairly low cost and actually try some ideas out uh, in a secure manner uh, with some kind of a sandbox approach. Um, on innovation, I see all kinds of innovation around the world at the moment, largely around inserting AI and machine learning into, into traditional workflows, things like document management or voice. Uh, for example, the Spanish uh, welfare agency recently used a chatbot when the COVID crisis first hit to manage uh, welfare payments. We got 7,000 hits a second. 
and the system managed it and diverted uh, you know incoming callers to the right resource um and so just things like that you know the scale of that was just unimaginable we'd never seen anything like that much in google and actually we were pleasantly surprised to be honest that this scaled that rapidly that quickly because we've never been able to test it to that extent um but even even some other strange things like we've got buses running around the us looking for potholes just by image analysis you know and so when you start to think of where you could save money or resources using this technology, if you can see it as a vision or hear it as a voice or read it as a document, there is the technology now to you know, take cost out, be more effective, prioritize and triage. I mean, that simple example of potholes, you know, you're triaging where to send your, your road teams to go, go first. Um, but that applies to a lot of things in life, even the other end of the spectrum in the clinical world, which is where triage is used all the time, you have models uh, to help um, eye consultants triage the most needy eye patients in a place like India, where there's only a handful of eye consultants. So it's about prioritizing. Yeah. And I think it's really good to have those concrete examples. It helps people understand what this is about and maybe helps tackle the culture issues as well. So thanks, Mark. Stefan, I'm going to come to you to answer as well the question around, can you do this and keep the lights on? Because that was your group was a bit, I guess, skeptical about whether we could do this. So your thoughts on that and then any examples you've got of where innovation and technology is working well? Yeah, first of all, I totally agree with um, everything that uh, has been has been said. Um, and um, I want to bring um, a new aspect into this, the discussion. We talked about ex innovation and ex innovation means that we abolish or risk worn uh, things we don't need anymore. So um, systems, processes, practices, technologies, whatever. And I think that exploration can bring us um, also to become or, or can help us to, to be more innovative, let's say. Um, so um, I think uh, this is uh, also a very interesting aspect. And if we, um, I think we, we um, have to be innovative. Um, uh, and one example for that is uh, the, the, um, the field of digital sovereignty. If we want to stay sovereign, then um, we need, or if we want to regain sovereignty, let's say, then I think we have to be um, uh, very innovative. Um, uh, one example might be, uh, for example, the field of digital identity. Um, we all see that um, big platforms um, from out of Europe um, are gaining, um, are, are getting into the field of, of a digital identity. Um, you all know um, the buttons lock in with Google, lock in with uh, Facebook and so on. And if we want to regain uh, sovereignty in that field, then we have to be very innovative. We, um, we have to establish uh, ecosystems and uh, open, open systems um, that allow us to, um, to share almost every credential uh, without using such platforms. So um, um, it, we definitely have to be um, innovative just to compete with others. <clears throat> I think that's a really good point. It's not in a world where everybody's innovating. It's not really a question of can we do this? It's we have to do this in governments, in the civil services to to keep up with everybody else, but also to deliver those excellent services that we want to deliver to the public. Chris, I'm going to come to you. And this might be the last um, the last kind of thoughts actually on this. So um, can we do this and keep the lights on? You had a kind of cross cross group of, of officials from all different kind of um, professions and also any great examples that you know of from the UK or elsewhere of where technology is being used yeah. to innovate. Um, so my thoughts, uh, try and bring this home, are uh, first of all, I'm not sure it's necessary to see lights on versus innovation as, as opposing forces in government. Um, it, you know, the idea that inside government, every absolutely every area and every system, every service has to be innovating wildly at all times. Um, I don't know if that's uh, help helpful in terms of culture. That feels like we're swinging from one extreme to another. Um, I do think the challenges we've got around personalization of services, like Stefan was just saying there, like digital identity, allowing that, but also around accessibility. Um, there's all kinds of implications for, in, for our users of adopting new technologies, uh, whether it's voice tech or AI or anything else, that, that raise questions around the accessibility of services. And public services need to be accessible by everybody. Uh, we're not taking a commercial decision to say, well, it's okay if 20%, 30% of the population don't want to use us. We are the monopoly of 
uh, public service provision. So we have to make sure that we're, we're not alienating or excluding people by adopting particular technologies. That's important. Um, there's a quote I really like uh, from by a, a, a science fiction writer called William Gibson, which is that the future is all around us. It's just unevenly distributed. Um, and I think that's very true in government. It's very true in the public sector, where you can see pockets of great success and real innovation and real imagination, and it's working. Uh, one of the things we have to do is figure out how to scale that, both in terms of the outcomes they've 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 come to, but also the the manner and, and the the culture they've created that allows that to happen. Um, so I I choose not to see it as lights on versus innovation. I think it's we have to find a harmony between the things that we need to do now and that allow us to innovate, um, but also recognizing that you know it, it's it's not going to be a constant storm of uh, endless adoption of new technology. Um, but that should be possible. It should be possible if that is the appropriate technology to incorporate. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Really good to end on that positive note. Um, our time has flown by. Um, I think it's been a great discussion. You've shown both the benefits, what can be achieved by adopting new technologies, why it's so important, but also some of those um, stubborn obstacles that still exist that we need to overcome to be able to do this in the most effective way. And great to hear those examples from different countries, from Germany, from the UK and elsewhere, about what's already happening. So a huge thank you from me to our wonderful panellists there. Thank you so much for that brilliant discussion. Thank you to everybody else who is watching. Um, and I will see you shortly in the next panel, I hope, um, which will be starting in a few minutes' time. Thank you and bye to every all of our panelists today. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.